Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, uh, do you want to go on a voyage? I do. I want it to be a fantastic voyage. I don't necessarily have a fantastic voyage for you, but what if I told you that I had a maiden voyage for you? That'll do. Okay, well, that's good, because I am so very happy to have Tyler Garner on the show, uh, who has a game that is, surprisingly enough, called Maiden Voyage. Tyler, thank you for being on. Thank you for having me, Nathan. I really do appreciate it. Oh, no problem at all. Uh, Maiden Voyage, just from the outset, really seems unique in its its concept and its setting. Please tell me more about it so everyone can experience this together. I mean, the first thing that I would say, I, I guess, would be that, I mean, the basic tagline for the game is that it's a collectible card game with thematic roots in witchcraft and esoteric philosophy. I mean, that comes from, I mean, multiple different canvases. I mean, the it incorporates some of the folklore, some of the mainstream aspects of what we know is, uh, you know, pertaining to witchcraft, that kind mm-hmm. of thing, and really incorporate it into a way that properly represents the culture, so to speak, but mm-hmm. also delivering a card game that's pretty much absolutely nothing like all the other card games that are currently out there. Mainly, we achieved that through the incorporation of the tabletop RPG elements. There's a lot of uh, dice implementation, dice usage implemented in the overall gameplay. I would say it's seamlessly integrated into the turn-based play style of what you would come to expect from a collectible card game. But sure, I would say we, we definitely achieved after many years of playtesting and getting everything how it should be we pretty much achieved what we were looking to achieve and just hopes that everyone else likes it as much as we do uh, i i like the whole idea so witchcraft and esoteric philosophy now you know i i know what esoteric philosophy is of course i do, do you nathan yeah i totally do but you know what in case somebody else out there who is not me is is unaware tyler could you could you just explain a little bit more well, about what esoteric well, philosophy? on top of that nathan yes uh, not just what it is, why that theme? Because that's a very specific theme. Yeah, I agree. The reason I wanted to touch on that subject is just because not only have I always been interested in making a card game, I've always been a huge fan of card games since I was a child, basically. But, um, I mean, as I grew older, it seemed to be the main uh, subject, I guess you would call it, that uh, I was interested in. Um, I pretty much researched any type of religious, mythological, philosophical thing that you could potentially come across. Mm. Um, the esoteric philosophy, I, I use that word because I, anytime you use the word occult, there's automatically a negative connotation that comes across which um, isn't necessarily fitting for what exactly is being spoken on. Esoteric philosophy, there's various different ones. Esoteric just meaning hidden, so to speak, Mm -hmm. similar to what the word occult would mean. That Just that word has a negative connotation. Hidden in the sense that not be known to the general population. It, It deals with, you know, religious concepts but once you get into the esoteric side it's really how it's more so not about dogmatic theological beliefs but more so the side of its relation to the psychological nature of the human being that kind of thing i don't Mm. i don't necessarily want to delve too deep into it but that's just always something i was interested in and there's a few particular esoteric philosophies that i would say played somewhat of a role into the game whether it be some of the card names that are present in the game to the implementation of the theory of synchronicity, which is 
part of the game. It was part of an inspiration on different levels. Uh, yeah, I mean, just by looking at some of the cards, I, I can kind of get what you're saying. There's there's herb cards, there's, uh, you know, like mortar and pestle, and, and maybe sort of things that people would associate with kind of like alchemy or that sort of thing might not be what we would consider like modern medicinal sort of, of uh, references. It, it seems more arcane. Well, pretty much every herb card except the arcane dust, that's mm. not a actual thing. No, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a thing. I don't know. If, I don't know if you're aware. Oh, shoot! <laughs> but um, everything, everything aside from that was pretty much inspired from the research that I've done on um, actual magical herbs. Um, a well-known author in that community, uh, Mr. Cunningham, he has a lot of books on. He actually wrote the encyclopedia on magical herbs, what their effects are, how you can utilize them. Mm. to produce various effects a lot of the herbs in the game were inspired from you know what would be used as healing what would be used to protect what would be used to paralyze and poison that side of it i guess you could uh, deem it esoteric but it was more so uh, directly related to i wouldn't call it paganism but just more so on that side of things for example um the spear of arrows it's deemed as a vile weapon. There's different card types in the game, one of them being a vile weapon. Deemed mm. as a vile weapon because it induces physical damage rather than magical damage. But oh. that that was influenced from um, Gnosticism. That That's actually a, a common term used in, in Gnosticism. And I mean, it's sparingly that, that those type of influences seep through in terms of the way the game is projected. Uh, there's a lot of mythology and of course the overall theme of it being a power of three which is even mm -hmm. on a mainstream level commonly known by many people but mm -hmm. it essentially just tried to incorporate various levels of it just so that there was you know it was equally fitting for all the different sides of the way you could look at witchcraft so how uh, how long have you been like interested in this particular subject matter probably since i can remember but of course all right being, yeah since uh since <laughs> when i was younger of course i mean you're, you're not really you're not really gonna come across you know anything deep until you you get a little bit older but i always had questions of course and a lot of things didn't make sense to me but mm -hmm. um i would say around 18 or 19, I believe I discovered the Hermetic philosophy, which was really interesting to me, mm -hmm. and it pretty much cascaded from there. Now, uh, Alex, you're probably more familiar with this kind of subject matter than I am. What, the, the quote-unquote occult? Uh, in that realm, yeah. Are you, are, you, are you calling me a witch, Nathan? Uh, do you weigh as much you... as a duck? That's all I want to uh... know. <laughs> No comment. Okay, no comments. fair enough. But but any, anyway, what do you think about it? I I love Ouija boards. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, no, that that's 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 totally just a sham. No, I think it's a really interesting subject. Um, it's it's reminds me. The first thing that comes to my mind is a card game for all the goth kids. Not because it's inherently gothic, but because they're usually the ones who end up researching this stuff on their own time because they're interested right. in it. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> Which is fine, because everybody's got to like something, and it's a really interesting subject matter, even from a philosophical point of view, or from a uh, real-world point of view, where you've pulled all this uh, information from, like the herbs and what they're used for medicinally. Right. I think it's really neat. It's kind of like Magic the Gathering, but mm. real-world mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering. Mm. Yeah, essentially, and... <laughs> uh, I would say um, knowledge of like any type of like esoteric philosophy isn't even necessarily needed to understand the game in any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the game mechanics, um, I'm glad that you brought up Magic the Gathering just because part of the thing that I noticed in the evolution of card gaming, Magic has been around for a long time. But um, it seemed that most games are essentially a in some way shape or form they're receiving a lot of inspiration from the mechanics of the way magic the gathering works um mm -hmm. i mean you have 
pretty much every game is you have a creature card or some form of creature cards and the creature itself has abilities that they have maybe a certain attack uh they can deal damage directly and then maybe you have sorcery cards and magic there's like artifact cards trap cards essentially a lot of games are extremely similar we actually strove to make this nothing like that Uh, which is hard yeah and it actually wasn't as hard as i thought it would be because the night that i decided that i wanted well if i made a card game what would it be and the idea sort of was right there already is um i mean the witches themselves they have various characteristics components to them um i mean they have the health points of course that's always going to be something that's that's going to exist but uh they have an orb rating which the orb rating pretty much decides the damage output of a witch but they need to be equipped with a wand so if they use a wand that's whatever their orb rating is is going to be their damage output and then you have other cards such as the idol cards some grimoires certain cards like that a few of them increase the orb rating of a particular witch so their damage output increases which is part of uh, the structure of gameplay you're pretty much always going to have three witches on the field and it's you're gonna there's an equip system like so you're equipping your witches with different tool cards which is if you, you look into witchcraft at all it's it's really tool based they talk about how it's all about tools and that kind of thing you basically want to use your tool cards to either empower or harm your enemy in some way whether it be paralyzing disarming that kind of way develop your strategy throughout the match to end up winning the match through killing half of the opponent's coven three of the six witches in the opposing deck that equip system Uh is something that's not really that i've never seen utilized in Mm. in a card game maybe there's a card game out there but essentially if you uh, the witch itself is doesn't really have any power without the the tool cards that you equip to it and um aside from just the health points and the orb rating each witch also has a bloodline there's three different bloodlines in the game and each bloodline associates with the one of the three different wand types in terms of the wand types there's celestial wands primordial wands and elemental wands and each like i said each witch bloodline associates with one of the wand types which Mm -hmm. you'll see denoted on the witch card there's a bloodline there's a blood symbol directly underneath the witch image and then also on the wand cards if a witch is equipped with a wand that directly corresponds to her bloodline that which can access the hidden power of the wand giving them an additional ability when using that wand which oh. is yeah it can be used strategically oh, okay. throughout the match play the other thing that a witch has is a path ability which uh, there's 12 different path abilities 12 different witches so every witch has a different path ability and hmm. these can range from sorcery heresy submission vampirism charm which they all have specific effects which you know makes them more you can pretty much decipher how i should utilize this witch during match play against my my opponent um Mm. there's just there's a lot of different layers to it which i feel like was not really found in a lot of other card games that i ever played and i've always been really interested in in a lot of different card games and i just tried to make everything completely unique to anything i had ever experienced and Mm -hmm. i feel like once people have the opportunity to play the game they will agree yeah i want to i want to back up for one second just so that i can uh, clarify a few things um so there's there's two different kinds of decks right there's there's a warlock deck and a quaker deck that's correct Okay, so when uh, when I'm playing, let's say I'm playing against Alex because uh, that seems like a thing I would do. I'm gonna have one deck, and he's gonna have the other one. That's correct. Okay, okay, correct. So, uh, in each one of those has six witches in it. Yes. So okay, so now I understand this, or at least I understand that part. <laughs> um, 
So now what I'm trying to figure out is uh, just uh, just help me with the the basic like uh, gameplay aspect. So it's my turn. And, and uh, you know, obviously I want to, uh, you, you know, uh, kill Alex because I always do. But but uh, what am I going to do on my turn? Uh, what what can I do on my turn to actually uh, to actually defeat him? Well, the way the game works, there's uh, three phases, which is. I mean, I think magic incorporates that in some way. But, mm-hmm. I mean, y- your first phase is your draw phase. You're either going to draw a card from your deck pile, or you're going to, if you have a magic circle active, you can attempt to roll for synchronicity for the opportunity to draw from your spell pile. How that works, rolling for synchronicity is essentially attempting to manifest a particular number at a six-sided dice roll. So. If you're magic and the magic circle cards, they have a duration and an inflation cost duration being just how long they last for how many turns the inflation cost. Part of it is how many attempts you have to roll for synchronicity when not only activating that magic circle, but if you're going to go for your spell pile at the beginning of your draw phase. So if you are successful, if you're successful in doing that, you say four and roll a four. Then you draw from your spell pile, and then the spells are a little bit more powerful than the a lot a lot of the other cards, which is the purpose of the spells mm-hmm. overall. But right. that's that's the draw phase. the The second phase would be the prep phase, which is that's where you're going to be equipping your witches on the field with whatever tool card you would like to put on them at that point. Okay. There's, like I said, there's always three different witches on the field. So you're basically okay. developing a strategy, looking at the tool cards in your hand, deciding, you know, do I want to build up my attack at this point? Is my is this particular witch's health points running low? Do I want to try to protect her, mm-hmm. heal her, do something? You're you're pretty much equipping your witches based on where you are in the game. Um, okay. So, okay. so that's that's the the prep phase, essentially equipping your witches with particular tool cards, and then the action phase is where you're going to be activating those tool cards. Uh, whether it be if you have a particular witch equipped with a wand, you want to attack one of the opposing witches. If mm-hmm. you say you have an idol on one of your witches, say you're playing the Quaker deck and you got the consecrated candle on one of your witches, which the um, the ability of the consecrated candle it increases the orb rating of an allied witch so you want to activate that so the witch w- that has a wand on it is going to have increased damage output and then you may on your third witch you may be one of your witches may be running low on health points so you equip whether it be the holy water or the cleric hymnals grimoire to help heal up that witch while she's attacking I mean, there's okay. there's numerous strategies, and like I said, it's a multi-layered game to the point where yeah. it's almost hard to pinpoint a basic description of you know how to go about right each turn. the The rule book is I spent a lot of time making sure the rule book was very clear. So hopefully, um, when once everybody gets a chance to play it, they can uh, they completely understand exactly what's going on. Sure, sure. See, I was really looking forward to getting like a shortcut of how to win the game, but I, I guess I'm just gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to do the research and and look at it a little closer. So when the when the game starts, I I have three witches in front of me. Yeah, you actually start each match. You choose two initiates. That's the other thing that I didn't mention that each witch has. They have a rank, and it's either initiate or high priestess. Okay. And you either you select two initiates and one high priestess and then you pull the a wand card of your choice and then the two satchel items which is the alembic and the mortar and pestle. Mortar and okay. pestles used to ground herbs. The alembics used to craft elixirs once you have all the required herbs that a particular elixir needs to be crafted. So you equip your three witches with those three items. Mm -hmm. And then for the first three turns, there's actually a grace period. No combat may be initiated. It actually gives each player the opportunity to ground any herbs that they may have drew in their starting hand or if they drew a magic circle 
gives them the opportunity to try to get a circle up before the actual combat begins. I see. I see. It means you can't first turn kill somebody. Oh. Also, also, Alchemy 101. <laughs> Double also. I had a question, and it's not a rules-rated question. It's a choice-related question. Why is it called a warlock deck? Because any witch worth their salt would be insulted by it being called a warlock. Well, the thing is, it was essentially a choice of... You know, it's it's essentially supposed to be white magic versus black magic. So when I was developing the names for the two sides, I just couldn't come up with anything that I really that really felt right when I was, you know, going through the list of what I should label each deck. It, it actually, once I came up with that list, it was I it it just felt like it was Quakers and Warlocks. That was really what it what it was. So I just went with that, went with my gut instinct. So to answer your question, Alex, uh, when they see Warlock, they know, oh, these are like the bad guys. Because well, well, that, we don't well, that, like that. Well, that's the thing, Nathan. Yeah. The question was because a Warlock is a bastardization. Male witches are still witches. They're not Warlocks. You have explained so this if you were, in the past. So if you were to call a person who is a male witch a Warlock, they they would probably be very upset with you if they were the type to care i have I heard that. that that's a thing yeah nathan says i know some stuff about the esoteric and that's, the cult. Yeah, see you know, that's why <laughs> i wanted you to chime in because because uh, you're, that, you're that's more why i was this. asking you're more familiar with this i'm just saying you had mentioned that there were uh several kinds of cards uh right. that there were like five different types of cards in the deck and uh could you could you kind of give me a rundown of what those five were sure I mean, aside from the witches, uh, you have your tools. The various tools include wands, which are, you know, a witch's main form of attack. Uh, damage output of a wand depends on the orb rating of the witch that wields it. And I covered briefly covered the bloodline right. wand type association. So okay. there's that. That's that's essentially how the wands work. Um, you have idols. Once you activate an idol, they actually last for three turns. Once you activate it, the effects of an idol take place there, but recur for the next two turns. Grim, mm -hmm. uh, grimoires and idols are the two cards that last for three turns. The difference between each of them is when a witch activates a grimoire, it can't be broken. It's going to last for those three turns. Idols can potentially be broken. Um, mm. It does... If, say, for example, if you had a witch that activated the sacrificial goat head, which is an idol that mm -hmm. increase, drastically increases the orb rating of each allied witch, each of your allied witches, and I, I of course, am going to want to break that, mm -hmm. you would duel in that situation, and a duel is where we each roll a six-sided dice. Whoever has the highest numbers is, is the winner, essentially. Mm. So idols are breakable. Grimoires are not. Real quick, one of the path abilities on the Warlock side is Heresy. That path ability basically entails that idols activated by a witch with Heresy act as Grimoires. So if a witch with Heresy activates an idol, it's pretty much unbreakable. It acts as if it was a Grimoire. So that's oh. just one of, yeah, that's one of the path abilities. Okay. Um, so, so we have, so that's the Wands, Idols, Grimoires, the Vile Weapons. Like I said, they induce physical damage or some type of some type of physical damage rather than magical damage. Once you activate them, it's a one turn thing. Mm -hmm. The effects of that vile weapon occur, and then they go to the graveyard. the The vile weapon does, and then you have magic circles and spells. Um, I, I briefly touched on the magic circles. Right, they have an inflation cost and a a duration. Once you, if you activate a magic circle, then you have the opportunity to use spells, uh, and spells can only be used while a magic circle is active. Uh -huh. The only, the only other tool types after that is the herb cards, the elixir cards, and the satchel items. And the satchel items are just used to, like I said, mortar and pestles use the ground herbs, and then the elixirs, they have a certain number of requirements for mm -hmm. uh, to craft a particular elixir and you have to have all those grounded up before you can craft it um 
on the field layout, I don't know if you had the opportunity to look at that. I can't remember if I if I had sent you a rule book. I do have the field layout in front of me. Okay. Well, yeah, the satchel is actually where you put herb cards that you have not grounded yet. And oh, the okay. elixir cards that you have not crafted yet, those cards can go there. That way it uh, gives you some space in your hand. I see. Um, and then, and you can also put the satchel items in the satchel when you're not using them. But then, once say you ground a herb card, the herb card will go to your hand. So any herb card that you ground, you're going to be holding until you take that alembic out to craft an elixir, and then you discard the the herb cards and then put the elixir in your hand. So that's that's a basic run through of how the the crafting system works Mm. but yeah those are the those are generally the the various tools that are found within the game i see uh i was noticing that the the circles also have stats on them so when they're on the field can you attack them just like you could attack one of the witches the magic circles aren't attackable once you activate them there's a there's a special spot on the field that they go to and they just remain active for the length of the duration which is noted on that on that magic circle card oh that's what that number is oh here's a real quick question for magic circles are any of them salt no you really wanted it we just missed a great supernatural reference even though i don't watch supernatural (laughs) <laughs> we missed See, the I reference of the thing you I had no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> you missed you um, missed the salt thing. salt they use as a um protective barrier, I think, in the show, yeah. but also in that entire field. Yeah. yeah. Salt is a thing. Yeah. Salt right. and lead. Right. Salt that's and... that was part of the reason I included the uh arcane salt. Pretty right. much any elixir that, that you would craft requires arcane salt as the base ingredient. Can I use table salt? No, it's gotta be arcane salt. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, I'm sorry. He was trying I'll to break just, the game. <laughs> get some, get some magic, and I'll just, I'll just be playing, and I'll just take my salt shaker and just throw it over the entire game, and be like, I win. <laughs> That's probably not the best way to win, but you know, yeah, it's worth a laugh. Yeah, once. yeah, it, it's good. So, salt and lead, you're saying, are are not good. Yeah, l- okay. lead is lead is good for warding off uh, evil spirits, Nathan. And Superman. That's just so he can't see into your bedroom at night. And uh, and salt's also good for defeating uh, Super Slug Man, because uh, if yeah, that, that's not not a real character yet, but if it was, it Salt Man, be. yeah, that's a that's a comic book waiting to happen. Uh, I, I mean, under, they have Ant Man, so yeah, yeah. I mean, all you need is like you, Under Slug instead of Underdog. You have Under Slug. And, uh, you know, uh, Super Salt Man is his uh, evil uh, nemesis. See, there's another card game you can make down in the future. Uh, <laughs> just terrible, terrible superheroes. I'll note that down. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, one of the things that we do do on the show is usually give you a whole bunch of terrible ideas for future games. So just, uh, just keep notes. <laughs> you might find something useful. Um, I've already started. Okay, good. <laughs> it's great. Hey, if you want Alex to refer to other shows that he doesn't actually watch, uh, just uh, leave a comment down below in the post. uh, Let us know. Uh, And, uh, oh, hey, why hasn't there been more Adventures of Slugman? I feel like that's a comic opportunity that has not been taken yet. Somebody get on that, please. I want to thank Tyler Garner for coming on to talk about Maiden Voyage, and we are going to be talking more about his Kickstarter on the next episode, which actually just started today, October 1st. And uh, if you want to find out more information about Maiden Voyage, just go over to goldchalicegaming.com slash maiden dash voyage. They, uh, they have some resources over there so you can actually see the cards and get a real good feel for the game uh, from a visual perspective. And if you want to find out more about Delve, you can go over to DelveCast.com. And while you are there, why not just check out our Patreon? We have some additional extra goodies for everybody who is joining us over there, uh, even at the one whole dollar level. Yeah, a $1 level. And if you are at a $5 shiny level, we will say your name on the show. And we actually have two shiny patrons. We have Don Perry and Bonnie Ainsworth. Thank you for supporting the show. We always appreciate it. 
You can find the show on iTunes and Google Play, all sorts of podcast apps. If you happen to use one that you prefer, why not uh, rate and review and subscribe while you are there? And if you happen to be in the mindset to give out some stars, I always like those. They're magic. They're, they're internet magic is what they are. And I like them. I'm a fan. Make sure to check us out on Twitter. I am at Citanium. Alex is at EXP Limited. And the show is at Delf Podcast. And uh, you can also follow Maiden Voyage at Maiden Voyage CCG. We will be expanding our realms of magic on the next episode as uh, Tyler comes back to explain uh, the Kickstarter and what he is offering to people who back that project. Uh, until then, though, I hope you find a little bit of magic in your life, too. And that was uh, kind of corny, but I'm going to go with it because I got nothing better. All right, everybody. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye. I, le I learned a lot about the game. Good. That's all we do here, Alex, is just teach you. Just, about... just learn. We just teach me about yeah, games. Yeah, that's how this... No one else needs to know. Just me. This, that's how it happens. It's not me not understanding games. It's to teach you about games. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I think it's it's fun because, like, when we started this show, Alex really knew uh, everything about RPGs, and he had to explain it all to me. And now it feels like we get to, you know, student becomes the master... Uh, and, and, uh, and now you get to learn stuff too, Alex. It's fun. Oh, okay. I mean, I've been learning stuff for the last four years, yes. but we'll, we'll, we'll pretend. Okay, we'll, we'll pretend. You're just learning things on a different level than I am. Yeah. I'm learning things on, ooh, cards are real. And you're learning it on, like, the, the actual, like, technical aspects of how things, uh, <laughs> yeah. Some, something okay. like that.